Always a frustrating thing, but uh, you see the clock ticking and you see the time going by and it's a great test in that moment of your patience. It's a good opportunity to just grow in the fruit of the Spirit. Yeah. <laughs> I mean, you'll never have patience unless you need patience. And patience doesn't come quick. You know, one man prayed, he says, Oh God, give me patience now. Okay. Doesn't work that way. Reminder of the story, actually, of the, uh, of the man who was late for an appointment and he was behind another car in front of him at the traffic lights and it was a lady driving the car. And she was fumbling with her handbag and she missed the lights turning from uh, red to green and by the time she looked up they'd gone back to red again and he was so angry he was so annoyed because he was late for his appointment and you know time is all relative okay time the time really is relative when when you're late you know time seems to go much 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 quicker einstein once described the theory of relativity of time where he said he said, a few moments sitting on a hot stove, okay, can seem like forever. Being in the presence of a beautiful woman, he says, time just goes so quickly, okay. <laughs> and it's all relative, and so she had missed the turn in, and he had got so angry and so annoyed, so he began to beat the horn. He began to shout, he began to wave his hands. He was so irate. And a policeman came up beside him and tapped on the window. And he said, sir, would you please get out of the car? And the driver was so angry. He said, he said look, he said, that silly woman in front, she missed the lights, I'm late and for an appointment. Now you're telling me to get out of the car. He said, sir, please get out of the car. He said, you can't arrest me. He said, for, for being angry at someone who missed the traffic lights. And he was shouting and wailing. And the policeman said, sir, I'm not arresting you for being annoyed that someone missed the lights but he said I couldn't help but notice as you were ranting and raving in the car the sign in the back that said wise men follow Jesus wise men still do I couldn't help notice the cross hanging from the mirror in the front I couldn't help notice the fish sign on the back of the car and the sticker that says yeah I am a Christian I follow Jesus he says sir I'm not he said, arresting you for getting annoyed with the woman. He says, I think you may have stolen the car. <laughs> <Okay>. <laughs> Somebody's always watching. <laughs> Someone is always, always watching. Okay. So I want us to read the scripture tonight in Mark chapter 12. As some of you know, in the past when we've come, uh, as John mentioned this morning, uh, we've we published books for people and we help people to write books and write books ourselves and some of the books she mentioned this morning are outside available if you want to have a look at them there's my latest book is there on how to know the will of God for your life and how to discover God's plan and your purpose now one of the big questions before we get to read the scripture together that you know people have and Christians have as well because it's, it's, it's possible you know to go through the whole of your life and never really hear discover and fulfill your purpose and and people really are looking for answers for this what is my purpose in life some years ago a man by Rick Warren wrote a book called the purpose driven life and you know that book the purpose driven life became the best-selling book of the 20th century after the Bible the Bible was the number one best-selling book in the 20th century Rick Warren's book the Purpose Driven Life was the next best-selling book in the whole of the 20th century because people are desperately looking for purpose. What is my purpose? Why am I here? The very fact that when we became Christians, God didn't take us straight to heaven is that he's got a purpose for us here. And you know, becoming a Christian isn't about getting into heaven when you die, it's coming into the kingdom of God while you live and fulfilling the purpose that God has for you and I share a little bit you know in the book about how you discover and find your purpose Mark Twain the American author and writer he uh, he once said the two most important days in a person's life are the person are the day they were born and the second day is the day they realize what they were born for yeah. now that 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 is uh, he wasn't a Christian Mark Twain and and that is uh, good advice but it's not a full truth. 
I, I like to add another day, the three most important days in a person's life. The day you were born, the day you were born again, and the day you realize what you were born again for. That you have a purpose. God has a plan, but you You normally find that people with purpose are usually the most pa- passionate, they're the most objective, they're the, the people who are not easily put off, they're people who know where they're going and know what they're about. They have a goal, they have a vision. You discover your purpose by asking yourself three questions and I go into this in much more detail in the book. But let me just quickly say this, this is so important because purpose is so necessary that we discover it in our lives. First question you ask yourself if you want to discover your purpose in life is simply this, what do you enjoy doing? You know, what, what rocks your boat? What ticks the boxes? What lights your fire? What makes you want to get out of bed in the morning? And on those cold winter days when you throw black the blankets, you get up and you say, oh, good morning, Lord, instead of saying, oh, good Lord, it's morning. Okay. <laughs> What's your purpose? Why do I get up on Monday morning? What's the purpose of my life? And what do I enjoy doing? Because your purpose will be connected to that in some measure and in some way, because God isn't going to give you a life of doing something that you hate. He's not that kind of a God. What do I enjoy? What, what, what do I enjoy? Second question you have to ask yourself is, what am I good at? I mean, what am I naturally gifted for? What am I spiritually gifted for? And we all have different talents and different abilities. And what, are, what, what can I do well? And that's a very important question to ask because uh, your, your purpose isn't going to be something that you're no good at. I mean, <laughs> I often uh, would say to you, you know, my, my wife, she sings. I sing. I sing when I sing. She ministers when she sings. <laughs> okay? There's a difference. I enjoy it. She's good at it. She's talented. She's gifted in it. And we have to be careful when we, you know, seek to discover our purpose that we don't fall into the trap of pride or false humility. You know, pride is thinking far more of yourself than you ought. And if, in fact, pride is just realizing, somebody once said, pride is a bit like bad breath. You're the last person to know you've got it. Everybody else can, can see it. Okay. And God, he opposes the proud. He gives grace to the humble. You know that scripture that said, if God is for us, who can be against us? Have you ever thought of it the other way? If God is against you, who can be for you? Okay. God, he opposes the proud. But there's also a false humility as well, you know, that puts yourself down. Humility isn't thinking you are nothing. Humility is simply realizing Jesus is everything. And in him you can do all things because he'll give you strength. So humility isn't putting yourself down. Humility is lifting Jesus up. That's humility, okay? And there's a false humility. Oh, I can't do this. I can't do that. Oh, no, not me. And, you know, you, you don't want to step forward. You don't want to step out. Be, be careful. Because a false humility is just another form of pride. Like the young pastor who preached in his first pastorate and his first sermon and one of the elders went up to encourage him after the sermon and he said, young man, he said, he said, that was very good today. And the preacher, young preacher, didn't know how to take the compliment and wanted to appear very humble. And he says, oh, he says, oh, no, he said, it wasn't me. He said, it was God. And the old elder smiled and said, young man, he said, it wasn't that good. Okay. (laughs) Of course it was you. Learn how to take a compliment, but give the glory to Jesus. Okay? And so, what am I good at? And then, the th- that's usually where the world would stop, by the way. Those two questions. That's where most people in life look to discover their purpose. What do I enjoy doing? What am I good at? Bang. But in the kingdom, we always have to ask ourselves a third question. Because, for instance, you may enjoy Robin Banks. You may be good at robbing banks, but I guarantee that is not your purpose to go out and rob banks. So the third question we always have to ask ourselves, and I go into this in far more detail in the book, is, is this, is what is God blessing in my life that I'm doing? And when those three things come together, you enjoy it, you're good at it, God is blessing it, go for it. 
go, go, for, go for it. And they say, how do you know that God is blessing it? Well, you have a sense, you know, when you've done well and the sense that when you haven't done so well. When people are ministered to, when people are encouraged, when there is good fruit that comes out of it, when there's positive things that come from it, say, thank you, God, you're on that. So I'd, I'd encourage you, you know, you just to go away and just to pray that through. You have a purpose. And in the kingdom of God, that purpose keeps on growing. It's not dependent on age. It's actually more connected to attitude than to age. <laughs> because, you know, do you know what the years go by? Sometimes we can think, wow, the years have gone so quickly. Do you know why the years go so quickly? It's because we are not made or created just for 70 or 80 years. We are created for eternity. Our bodies may only last a certain time, but we have been created forever and for eternity. And that's why 60, 70 years seem to be so little and go by so quickly. It's because you're not just made for that short period of time. We are made forever. And in the kingdom of God, it's not like the world. In the world, you reach a certain age and you get to that age and they say, oh, your best years are behind you. And, you know, you get you. You can get to your 30s and 40s, say, ah, your youth is gone now, it's, you know, it's a bit downhill from you. You get to your 40s, your 50s, you get to your 60s and 70s, you say, ah, you'll almost be over the hill. You get to your 80s, you say, ah, there's no more hills, you know, it's... Yeah, have, have, you, have you heard of the music group Hillsong? Well, they brought out a new music group for the over 70s, it's called Over the Hill Song. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> but that's just how the world would see it. But you know what, in the kingdom of God, and this is absolutely true, whatever age you are, the best is still to come. Amen. The best is still to come. A 90-year-old man taught me that when I was pastor in my first church. He used to say to me, Pastor, I've had a wonderful past, but I've got an even better future. A big smile on his face. And it's so, so true. Now, I want to read to you Mark 12 tonight. And it's, see, it's an answer to the most important question that Jesus was probably ever asked. And in Matthew, Mark chapter 12 and verse 28. And one of the scribes came and heard the others arguing with Jesus and recognizing that Jesus had given them very good answers. He asked Jesus this question, what commandment is the greatest of the ball? In other words, what is the most important thing that God wants in our lives? What's the greatest commandment of them all? Jesus answered, he said, the foremost, the greatest commandment is this, Hear, O Israel, the Lord our God is one Lord, and you shall love the Lord your God with all your heart, all your mind, all your soul, all your strength, with all your being. The second is this, you shall love your neighbor as yourself. There is no other commandment greater than these. And the teacher, the scribe, said to him, Right, teacher, you have truly stated that he is one, and that there is no one else beside him. And to love him with all the heart, with all the understanding, with all our strength, to love our neighbor as ourselves is much more important than all the burnt offerings and sacrifices. And when Jesus saw that he had answered intelligently and wisely, he said to him, you are not far from the kingdom of God. A little while ago, a few years ago actually, my daughter, she gave me a book for Christmas. And it was a book of answers to examination questions. These are actual answers that were given to exam questions. And uh, I just, it was, it was a bit of a fun book, but these are true answers to, to, to difficult questions or what the examination was supposed to be posing as difficult questions. And here are some of the answers that people gave to the to the questions. Geography, okay? Name six animals that live 
in the Arctic Circle. Answer, two polar bears and four seals. Okay. <laughs> Question, physics. Why would living near a mobile telephone mast be harmful to your health? Answer, you might walk into it. Okay. <laughs> History. Where did they sign the Declaration of Independence? Answer, at the bottom of the page. <laughs> Biology. What happens to your body as you get older? Answer, you start to go to the toilet more often and eventually you go intercontinental. <laughs> okay. Question. Geography. Where did they build Adrian's Wall? Answer. Around Adrian's Garden. Okay. <laughs> Psychology. Question. Give an example of a dream that helps to explain Freud's theory of sexual suppression. Answer. If you dream about biscuits, subconsciously, you are thinking about sex. But if you dream about sex, you want to eat a biscuit. Okay. <laughs> Question, mystery, last one. What is Britain's highest award for bravery? Answer, Nelson's column. Yeah. <laughs> one, of, one, one of my favorites, actually, was the... Uh, the speaker at Hyde Park Corner at Speaker's Corner and he was being heckled by an atheist and kept shouting out, where did Cain get his wife? And uh, he, he just ignored him for a while. He said, where did Cain get his wife? Where did Cain get his wife? And eventually the preacher stopped and says, look, I don't know where Cain got his wife. He says, but when I get to heaven, I'll ask him. <laughs> and the heckler, he smiled, he said, ah, he said, but he said, what if he isn't in heaven? And the preacher said, then you can ask him. Okay. <laughs> now, people ask questions for all different kinds of reasons. Some ask questions to trick you or to trap you. Some ask questions to show off how much they know. Some ask questions because they want to truly get at the truth. I want to know the answer to what they ask. And Jesus experienced all these different types of questions. And after he'd answered a couple of the most difficult of them, what about should he, uh, someone pay taxes or not to Caesar? And he brings out, the, he says, fetch me a coin, and whose inscription is upon it? And he says, Caesar's, and he says, render unto Caesar what is Caesar's, and unto God what is God's. What he's implying in that question, this is the background to the passage I read, is that that which bears the image deserves the honor. Okay. And then he could have turned around and said to them, and whose image are you made in? <laughs> you know? They marveled at his answer because it was a trick question. Because whatever he was going to say was going to get him into problems. If he says, don't pay taxes, the authorities would be after him. If he said, do pay taxes, the people would be after him because Rome extorted such heavy burden upon the people. It's such an amazing answer. They marveled at him. Then the old Sadducees come out, and these were people who were powerful political religious but they they really didn't believe in much of the supernatural they didn't believe in much of the afterlife they didn't believe in the resurrection and so they tr try and trick him with a question about a man a woman who was uh, married to a man and he died and so she married his brother and his brother died and then she married his other brother and his other brother died and then she married his other brother and his other brother died and all his brothers died about seven of them died the first thing I would have said to that is, it says, don't marry that woman, okay? <laughs> but they were trying to trick him, and they said, now in the resurrection, who will she be married to? And his response to that is, he says, you are in error because you do not know the scriptures or the power of God. That is, that is interesting. Let me put a comma there, because you can fall into theological error, not just by not knowing the word, but not knowing the power of the God that you serve as well, who inspired the word. He says, you have fallen into error because you don't know the words, but you don't know the God who inspired it and the power that he is capable of. You are in error because you don't know the power or the scriptures. He says, in the resurrection, he says, we'll be like the angels. He says, 
says we won't be given and taken in marriage in the same way as we understand it now he says but have you never read he says when god appeared to moses he says i am the god of abraham isaac and jacob and the god of the living and not the god of the dead and they marveled again at his answer they thought this was a foolproof question that had no answer and he answered it in such an amazing way that there's now this very religious pharisaical teacher lawyer there an expert in the law and he steers these responses and so here's this moment to ask jesus a question that has been debated for centuries the different schools of theology between the different groupings of uh, sadducees pharisees i mean they'd all been debating down through history of all the commands that god had given of all the laws of all the regulations of all the rules of everything that had come down through the prophets through moses down through history of all the things that god had asked and required what is the what is the one most important thing of all what what is the most what is the biggest what does god require more than anything else what is the greatest commandment that he has given and they've been arguing about this among themselves for century after century so here's this moment it says jesus what do you say what is the most important commandment of all in other words of everything that god has ever said what does he require most of my life what's the main thing what's the big thing what's the number one and jesus goes back to something that he had given to Moses even after there had been the Ten Commandments he had said to Moses and this was really the foundation of the Jewish faith hear O Israel the Lord thy God is one you shall love the Lord your God with all your heart all your soul all your mind all your strength and you shall love your neighbor as yourself it's a, it was it's probably the first uh, scripture that uh, a, a young Jewish child learns it's prayed morning and evening in the synagogue. It, it's central to the, to the worship uh, there within the, the life and ministry of the synagogue. And it's very well known, but sometimes things that become so well known, they were arguing about so many other things. He brings them back right to foundational truth and understanding. He said the most important thing of all, he says, that you love God and you love others. See, what had happened was that after the Ten Commandments, more commandments had been given, more laws had come down, and then through the centuries, more had been ha added. By the time it had come to Jesus' day, the Pharisees had taken the law, and they had divided it into, into 615 other laws, and then to those 615 other laws, they'd added subdivisions and subclauses. There were thousands of laws and rules impossible for anyone to keep them all and so it had become so confusing and so complex and, and so in the midst of that they say what's what, what what is the main thing and you know, one of one of the ways that we find success in our spiritual life is to always keep the main thing the main thing and not allow ourselves to become so distracted by secondary things when church keeps the main thing the main thing to love Jesus and to love one another okay you'll experience the blessing and the presence of God when we get distracted by other things other things may be significant they may be important but we have to see them in the light of the main thing not the main thing in the light of them we get things in order. And so Jesus is putting everything here back into order. And the way he does it is so amazing because it is so simple. He says, what God desires more than anything else is that you love him. In other words, he said, it is not about religious observance of laws. It's relational obedience and love. See, one of the things that religion does is it tends to complicate everything and it tends to make everything more complex and that's true of any religion you can look at in the world today even if you try and make christianity into a religion it will become so full of complexity 
There are these rules to keep. There are these pathways to follow. There are these pillars that we must abide by. Pilgrimages to go on, places to see, things to do. You must bathe in this holy river. You must go to this holy site. You must find yourself. You must lose yourself. I mean, it just goes on and on. And you look at any of the world's religions and to follow them. And this is what religion is, you see. It becomes so complex. It was the issue that Martin Luther grappled with in his day. And 500 years ago, we celebrate now the Reformation of what took place under Martin Luther. But this was one of the great problems that he had with his grappling with his own faith with God. As a young monk, he was terrified of God. He just saw someone as God to be feared, and he did everything he could to get his life right with God. And so he would fast. He would go on pilgrimages. He would even beat his body. He would study. He would read. He'd go to Mass. He'd go through ceremonies. He'd go through rituals. He went through it all, and he found no peace. So the answer was more rituals, more ceremonies, more complexity, worship more saints. And he still couldn't find the peace that he was looking for. So he had a very wise confessor, spiritual overseer, by the name of Johann von Stalpitz. And he was sharing with him, his turmoil, with him his turmoil that he was experiencing. And von Stelpitz, he very wisely suggested that Martin Luther read the Psalms to find peace. This is it's the advice we still give to people today when they go going through a, you know, em, 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 emotional trauma. Read the Psalms. And Martin Luther began to read through the Psalms and he began to find some solace there. And, and then von Stelpitz said to him, now, and read Paul's epistle to the Romans. And he began to read and study Paul's letter to the Romans. And he felt he understood it, but there was one phrase in it that terrified him. And it was the phrase in you know, chapter 1 and in verse 17, it says, For we are not ashamed of the gospel, it is the power of God you know, to those who believe, the Jew and the Gentile. For in it, a righteousness from God is revealed. And he had always feared the righteousness of God because he thought of God's righteousness as that which condemned him as a sinner. And he was terrified that this righteousness he would stand before one day and he would have no answer to give before it because of the way that he had lived and the things he had done and said and thought. And so this righteousness, he only saw it as something that condemned him. And then he describes the moment of revelation where he realized what it truly meant. It was a revelation moment, but it was more than that. It was an impartation and transformational moment. He says, he realized now that in the gospel, this righteousness has been revealed. That the very righteousness that condemns us when we reject it is the same righteousness that saves us when we accept it. Amen. Yeah. In other words, God doesn't have different thrones. He doesn't have a throne of judgment over there and a throne of grace over there. And when he's on his throne of grace, he jumps off the throne of judgment and jumps onto the throne of grace. The throne of judgment and the throne of grace, God has one throne. The throne of judgment becomes for us a throne of grace because the Lamb has been slain before it and we come through the blood of Jesus. And that which was once the judgment has now become that which he has judged in our favor and says there is no sin to answer for. He has presented a different judgment. And that which once condemned us is that which now saves us. It's the same throne. Is there? And so he, he describes the moment that when he had this revelation that if he just received in Christ the love of God and forgiveness of sin, that that righteousness of God that once judged him is the same righteousness that will make him clean and pure. For God was in Christ reconciling the world unto himself. It says that in Christ we might become the righteousness of God. And he described it like paradise being open, being born again. It was like everything became new. It was a new creation moment for him. He went back to his confessor, von Stalpitz, and he says, I have found what I've been looking for. 
I couldn't find it on the pilgrimages to Rome. I couldn't find it in my cell, beating myself, or fasting, or denying myself. I couldn't find it in any of the rituals or in any of the ceremonies. But I have found what I've been looking for. I found it in Christ. And that's all we need. And Von Staupitz, he says to him, he says, but Martin, he says, that's wonderful. But what will you put in place of all the pilgrimages and the indulgences and the relics and the prayers to the saints and the fastings? And Luther's answer to Von Staupitz was, he says, Jesus Christ. All man needs is Jesus Christ. And that was the burden of reformation. Yes, there was truth within that, the Catholic Church, and there is still great truth within the church. But what Luther came to realize is so often the trappings of religion is that you make lesser things more important than the main thing. That's what religion does. And he came back and he found that the main thing was knowing Jesus. And experiencing him in his life. And here's what Jesus is saying is that through the centuries, you've made all these other laws and you've added to it and you've complicated it and you've confused it. And it's so complex. And the wonderful thing I love about Jesus is it's so simple that even a five-year-old child can understand it. And a five-year-old child can respond to it and get wonderfully born again because they haven't got to understand lots of theologies and religions and practices and rituals and ceremonies. It's just Jesus. Amen. Love God and love your neighbor. You see, re see, religion, there are some good things about it. I mean, religion is people seeking after God. And that's why it does become very complex. <laughs> because if however much you seek after him, if he didn't want to be found, you would never find him. Okay? So you've always got to keep doing more and adding more. Whereas knowing Jesus and what we say and term as Christianity is not us seeking after God. It was God came seeking after us. And he came to seek and to save those that were lost. And so therefore in religion, religion always begins and continues with a great do. You've got to do this, you've got to do that, you've got to then keep doing this, and then you've got to keep doing that, and doing, 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 and, keep, and maybe at the end of it, and nobody really knows, but if you, can just, if you can just endure and do as much as you can, maybe then God will one day perhaps forgive you. And so religion is about a great do and keep on doing. Whereas knowing Jesus is about a great done. He said, it is finished. The debt has been paid. All you've got to do now is come and receive the benefit of it. So religion is always a great do. Entering into faith with Christ is a great it's done, okay? And then we do out of what's been done. We don't try to get to the done by what we do. But that's what religion is like. Somebody once said, you know, religion can be compared to this. It's like going into a restaurant and seeing a beautiful menu and looking at all the food and thinking, wow, that looks great. So you order the best food on the menu, but it never comes. All you ever get is the bill. <laughs> okay. Whereas knowing Jesus is the other way around. You order the food and the food always comes. And the bill has already been paid. <laughs> okay. That's the difference. And so Jesus, he says, love God. Don't have to complicate it. Don't have to make it so complex. Just love God all your heart, all your strength, all your mind, all your being. Love your neighbor as yourself. Now notice that he uses that little word all. It's only small, but it's so important. Because yes, it starts simply, but it requires everything. And the tendency that we have, even as Christians, in this relationship we have with God that he has given us in Christ, uh, 
is that fundamentally it, it is a heart issue. But because it is a heart issue, then we have to learn how to guard our heart and sometimes fight for our heart. Because sometimes our heart doesn't always like the word all. Our hearts can become divided. We can become double-minded. Our wills can be up and down, in and out. And this is where the relationship begins to go wrong. Because, see, out of relationship, there needs to be fellowship. If you're going to know God, it starts with a relationship, but it grows with fellowship. And in this fellowship with him, it is a hard thing. And the enemy is always trying to distract or to grab our heart. And our hearts can become divided. Our minds can be, we can become double-minded. One of the saddest stories I ever heard was of uh, a, a great uh, Christian leader at one time. And he pastored a huge mega church in Texas, headed up a, uh, a ministry of over two million intercessors across America. I wrote some brilliant books. As, as a young pastor, I bought all his books, great books about prayer. And there was no doubt that there was a touch of God upon this man. And, and then things went wrong. And he ended up, long story, but he ended up, he left his wife, left his family. And he got involved in an adulterous relationship with his secretary. Eventually left his family, divorced his wife, and went and married this other woman. And his wife that he had divorced some years later was being interviewed by a Christian magazine and asked about what had happened. And she said her husband, his name was Larry Lee. It, 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 it's out there on the internet and you can research all the details. It's, I'm not saying anything confidential. And, and Larry Lee, his wife, she said, he was great to me. He was a wonderful man. He, lo he was a marvelous father. He was a great husband. But she said it did go so sadly wrong. He said even when he was having an affair with this other woman and even when he, he said he was leaving us and leaving me and the children, he said that he still loved us. And she said, I do believe that he loved us. And I do believe that he still loves us. And he still loves the children. So why did he leave us if he loved us so much? She said, what I believe happened to my husband was this. She said, his heart became divided. He had opened his heart up to another woman that he should never have opened his heart to. You see, you can choose to open your heart to anyone you like. And you can fall in love with almost anyone or anything if you, if you choose to open your heart to them. That's why the Bible says we have to guard it. We have to fight for it sometimes. And he had opened his heart to someone that he should never have opened his heart to in that way. But the more he opened his heart to the other person and the more that got stronger and the more that grew, his heart became more and more divided until eventually there came a tipping point. And this is what happens when finally the relationship tips. There comes a tipping point that the other person has more of his heart than his wife had and the children had. And he decided that's the way he wanted to go. Whatever captures your heart will control your life. Whatever controls your life will determine your decisions, determine your destiny, determine the choices that you make. Life is made up of consequences and choices, and if you want good consequences, you have to learn to make good choices. What will determine the choices we make more than anything else are the values and the virtues we carry in our hearts, the passions and the priorities that are there. And when nobody's around to see what we do, and even if we think we can get away with it, what will determine what we do in that moment will be what's captured your heart. And hearts can become divided. And that's why James in James chapter 1 talks about, uh, you know, cleanse your hearts and you double and purify your minds, you double-minded. A divided heart will always lead to a double mind. Uh, and so we have to guard our hearts that is why I understand now David the psalmist when he prayed about his relationship with God and he knew the, the power of the heart to go astray his cry and his prayer was oh God give me an undivided heart 
that I may fear your name. And the reason we have to guard our hearts and our relationship with God, if we're going to grow in this relationship with him, is the devil is constantly after the, the heart. The heart is the master control area of our life. The heart and mind are really interconnected. In scripture, they, they're used interchangeably to describe the same thing as a man thinks in his heart, so is he. Jesus knew what they were thinking in their hearts. Because when, when the brain and the heart connect, it becomes the, you know, the mind. The brain is physical, the mind is spiritual. It's interesting, you know, you can change your mind, but you can't change your brain. <laughs> Not yet, anyway, okay? Because the brain is about the physical, but the mind is spiritual. The brain is simply about what we think. The mind is about how we think. And that's why two people can have exactly the same information and come to totally different conclusions because you process the information differently. Because you'll see the same thing, but you'll come to a different conclusion because of the way you think. You've got the same facts, the same details. Two politicians will look at the same data and they'll come to totally opposite conclusions of how to meet the problem because different things capture their heart, control the way they think. And we are all like it. Two scientists will look at the sky at night. One will look at the stars and say, wow, what an amazing creation. And fall on his knees before God. The other will look at the same stars and say, wow, what incredible chance. Aren't I clever to be able to discover all this? Uh -huh. They see the same stuff. They come to a different conclusion. That's why the Bible says, by the way, the fool says in his heart, there, there is no God or no to God. It's a heart issue. And the devil believes that we've all got a price and he's after our heart. And if you're going to grow in your relationship with God, you've got to guard that heart. I mean, the devil believed that David had a price. For him, it was a beautiful woman. When David was tired and perhaps feeling a bit low. With Achan in the Old Testament, it was some gold and some garments that he stole out of Jericho. With Judas, it was 30 pieces of silver. <laughs> With Balaam, it was the wages of wickedness, it says. The devil believes every one of us here tonight has got a price. Believes you've got a price, he believes I've got a price. And the reason I say that is because he believed Jesus had a price. He said, I'll give you all the kingdoms of the world if you bow down. If you worship me. You see, that's what it is in something that captures your heart. You begin to bow down. You worship it. Jesus says, get behind me, Satan. So what's your price? There was a, a man, a, a, an elderly man in a cafe one day, a very wealthy man, and he's sitting near a beautiful young woman, and he turned to the lady, and he said, he said I'm, I, I'm conducting a social experiment. Will you help me with this? She said, what's the question? She said, he said, I'm a very wealthy man. And he said, see that man sitting over in the far corner? Do you know him? Have you seen him before? She said, no. He said, if I was to offer you a million pounds, would you sleep with him? She thought for a moment. She said, are you serious? He said, I have the money. I wouldn't miss it. She said, for a million pounds, if you're serious, yes, I would do it. A million pounds. He said, see the man in the other corner over there? Have you met him? Do you know him? No, I've never seen him before. He said, if I was to offer you 10 pounds to sleep with him, would you do it? She looked at him aghast. She said, what kind of a woman do you think I am? <laughs> he said to her, he said, oh, he said, you've already told me what kind of a woman you are. I'm just trying to determine your price. You see the price. What's the price? What's the price? See, the difference between what some people do and what other people do isn't that they wouldn't do it or want to do it. They just have a different price level. And the devil is always looking for the price. And in the Old Testament, the Jewish people, they, when their hearts went astray and God brought judgment upon them, it's because the price was in worshiping other gods, they could feel liberated to do what they want. Other gods captured their hearts and they didn't stop worshipping God, but they just worshipped other gods alongside him. It's called syncretism. And you understand now why God had said, and even in the commands, you shall have no other gods before me, but you shall have also have no other gods beside me. 
The early Christians weren't persecuted because they worshipped Jesus. They were persecuted. They were led to the arena. They gave their lives because they refused to worship anybody else except Jesus. And they would not say Caesar was Lord. There is only one Lord. There's only one King. And so Jesus said, it's with all your heart, with all your mind, with all your strength, with all your being. That's what God wants. See, it starts simple, but it requires everything. If we're going to grow in our faith. And the lawyer said, he said, that is such an amazing answer. And he said, it is absolutely true. It's more important than all the sacrifices and all the religion and all the rituals. And when Jesus heard this, he turned to him and said something quite amazing. When he saw that he answered wisely, he said, I perceive that you are not far from the kingdom of God. Wow, this, this man, something had happened. Something was going on within his heart. And Jesus said, you are not far. But you know what that also says? It also says, you can be close, but you're still not in. You can be there on the outside and you're looking in and you agree with everything that's being said. You say amen to what's going on. You can even lift your hands to the songs and shout hallelujah to the preacher. And you can be really close. But you've never taken the step. You've never come and you've said, I do. I will. You've kept saying to that young lady, I love you, I love you, I love you. But you've never said at the altar, I will. And it can be the same with God. Oh God, yes, I believe in you. God, yes, you're wonderful. Oh God, you're marvelous. But there comes a moment where you have to step across from being close to coming in. And you know, there are many people who are close to the kingdom, but they've never stepped into it. Many people who go to church are close. Many people who pray. Many people who love God and believe in God. They're close, but they've never stepped in. Friend of ours in Aberdeen, for 76 years he lived his life, and for many of them he was close. And we would pray for him, his wife was saved, his family was saved, and he would come to church on Easter and Christmas and baptisms and special occasions, and he was one of the nicest men you could ever meet. And he was close, but he never came in. And we had almost given up praying for him. His wife had got so frustrated. She said, I've been praying for him for 40 years. 40 years. And see, you know the difference of someone who's close and who hasn't come in. There is a difference. You discern that difference. Because yes, even though he was one of the nicest people and didn't disagree with anything that was said or done and his wife he encouraged to go to church, there wasn't that spark of a spiritual life within him. And one day, it was, his, it was his young grandson who had said to him, Granddad, he said, you know, if we all die, he says, I'm going to heaven, Mommy's going to heaven, my brother's going to heaven, Nanny's going to heaven. He said, we're all going to heaven. What about you? And it was in that moment, after hearing probably hundreds of sermons, <laughs> and being witnessed to thousands of times, and having been prayed for, for thousands of prayers, that he says, you know, Callum, you're right. It's about time I got things right with God. And he, took, he was a changed man after that. I mean, when we went back to Aberdeen and we saw him, we could see the change. We saw him recently. He's now 86. He's a changed man. But all those years, he was so close, but he had never stepped in. See, how do you step in? Well, you step in by realizing how much God loves you, that Jesus gave his life for you. But that doesn't bring you over into the kingdom. That brings you close to the kingdom. What brings you into the kingdom is realizing now that he wants not only to give his life for you, but he wants to give his life to you. And the only way he can give his life to you is if you are willing to give your life to him. And there comes this connection together. And two become one. <laughs> you give your life to him, and he'll give his life to you. And your spirit will come alive as the Holy Spirit comes within you. The Bible calls it being born again or born from above. And that life relationship with God becomes established. You may be close, but are you in? One of the most wonderful things, and I'll just finish with this, is that where, wherever you travel, 
you know, in the world. Sin and the effects of sin are the same. Causes all kinds of problems and pain and fear and heartache. In fact, anthropologists tell us that even when they study people groups and they study even things like the spirituality within people groups and occultic practice within people groups, the same root, whatever the society, whatever the group, the same root in those who practice the occult and the same source is always there. They may call themselves witch doctors or shamans or, or priests or they may call them warlocks, but the root of occult practice all goes back to the same source. And we know, of course, what, what that is, that which is dark and demonic and devilish. But there's hundreds of different names <laughs> and types of practice of it, but it goes back to the same source. Wherever you go in the world, not only is sin and evil the same, but also, also is the power of the gospel the same. So you can meet people in different countries, cultures, different languages, people you've never met before, and immediately you meet them because they love the same Jesus you love. They've been born again with the same spirit that you've been born again with. There's an immediate connection with someone who is so different from you in so many ways, and yet you put your arms around them and you say, brother, you say, sister. You go into their churches. You can't sing the songs because you don't know the language, but you can worship together because you know the same spirits. And so you meet people from all walks and wherever you go, those who love Jesus, there's this immediate connection with them. And when they say things like, God has forgiven me, you say, I know what you mean. When they say things like, God has set me free. When they sing the song, my chains are gone, my heart is free. You say, I know exactly what you mean. Exactly what you mean. The same thing has happened to me. And there is this immediate connection. Because such is the work of God's grace. And not only geographically, but historically, that's true as well. And I'm going to ask the worship to come back as we just sing a song now in a moment. But you know, when you read through history of the great hymns and songs, one of my favorites is Be Thou My Vision. That was written almost 1,300 years ago. And 1,300 years ago, you could see someone standing in a little place, a little house, a little chapel, a cathedral, and they sing, Oh, be thou my vision, O God of my heart. Be all else to me, Jesus thou art. And they sing these amazing songs. They say, Oh, wow. I know exactly what they mean. And when we sang that with John Newton just now, Amazing Grace, my chains are gone. And when he talks through many trials, toils, and snares, you say, John, I know what you're on about. I know exactly what you're on about. 250 years ago, it happened to you. 25 years ago, it happened to me. Two weeks ago, it happened to me. But it's the same Jesus. It's the same gospel. It's the same Holy Spirit. It's the same work of grace. And it's all about loving God and loving other people. You're near the kingdom. Have you come into the kingdom? Let's stand together.